Ron, a year ago you were here and I asked you about a waiver that the President had just signed to delay for another six months the legally required move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So you said at that time that while you were disappointed by the signing of the waiver, you were absolutely confident it wasn't a question of if, but when the embassy was moved. Uh, last month, it was my privilege to be at the dedication ceremony for the new U.S. Embassy. And um, so your, your, your confidence was not misplaced, but tell our uh, activists why that was so important and what it means to the State of Israel and to Israeli-U.S. relations. Well, it, it was a historic day, one of the most historic days that I've ever seen in the 20 some odd years since I've moved to Israel. The whole country felt about uh, 10 feet taller uh, because we were probably standing on 3,000 years of our history in that city and, and also on the shoulders of the greatest power uh, on earth. And so we are deeply appreciative of President Trump's decision. And this is a decision route that's gonna echo across the generations. You know. The Jewish people remember Cyrus. 2,500 years ago, Cyrus enabled the Jews to go back, King Cyrus of Persia enabled the Jews to go back, return to Israel, and rebuild the Second Temple. It's actually the last verse in, in, in one of the books uh, of the Bible. We remember Cyrus from 2,500 years ago. Now, I'm not so sure the Persians remember Cyrus, but the Jewish people remember <laughs> Cyrus. And this decision of President Trump will be remembered for generations to come, and it's one of the great historic decisions that were made in the history of Zionism. A hundred years ago, you had the Balfour Declaration, which recognized the rights of the Jewish people to uh, a national home in our historic homeland. You had the decision at the UN in the partition resolution to mm -hmm. recognize the right of the Jewish people to a state 70 years ago in 1947. You had the decision in 1948, it took President Truman, all of 11 minutes to recognize the newly established state of Israel. And I would put this as the fourth. And because of what Jerusalem means to the Jewish people, we are going to carry this decision with us way out into the future. You know, there is no people on earth that has a relationship with a city like the Jewish people's relationship with Jerusalem because it captured our imagination and captivated our imaginations even when we were not a sovereign power there. Mm -hmm. For 2,000 years, we were dreaming of Jerusalem. We would turn in prayer towards Jerusalem. If you've been to a Jewish wedding, and when the groom, you know, stamps his foot on the ground and breaks that glass, he's remembering the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And you could actually sum up the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people in three Hebrew words. The Shana Haba'ab Yerushalayim. In English, it's four words. Next year in Jerusalem. Well, when you were there, the people of Israel could say, this year in Jerusalem. And we're deeply, deeply grateful. You know, we've, uh, to not say anything disrespectful about presidents who came before, because I had a very good friend who was one of them, George W. Bush, who I personally thought was the most pro-Israel president up until that time. But the Congress passed this law in 1995, uh, and Bill Clinton signed it into law. That was 23 years ago. Um, what is it in your experience? I know that you interact very closely with the White House and with this administration. Speaking as somebody who grew up in the United States, uh, but as somebody who now is an Israeli government official, what, what is it about him that you think made it possible for him to do something that so many had taken a pass on before? Willingness to stand against the current. And it's a test of real leadership. And, uh, and I appreciate many things that the form, former presidents, many former presidents, mm -hmm. uh, and all of them have done different things for Israel, yeah, so we're appreciative sure. of it. But this was a case where uh, President Trump thought this was the right thing to do. Uh, it should have been done 70 years ago, frankly. It has nothing to do with the peace process. People who say that have to ask themselves, well, Jerusalem was Israel's capital in 1949. What happened between 1949 and 1993 
when that peace process began. Why didn't they move it then? There was always another reason and always another excuse and always, always a, a somebody, a skeptic or a critic would say, do it in six months, we'll do it next year, we'll do it next year. Uh, and I think President Trump, he seems to be pretty comfortable standing against the current. <laughs> You know, you're, you know, for a lot of political leaders, you know, if they get hit, you know, with a bad editorial, it, you know, it'll ruin their day. I think President Trump seems to be able to keep going through his day, even with some shots against him. And I think he saw this is the right thing to do. It should have been done a long time ago. I promise to do it, and I intend to keep my promise, and that this is the right thing to advance peace. And here is something that I don't think people understand. The reason why we don't have peace is because the Palestinians refuse to recognize the right of the Jewish people to a state in our historic, historic homeland. That's what the conflict is about. And they try to deny any connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, any connection between the Jewish people and Jerusalem. So Arafat says to President Clinton, there was never a temple on the Temple Mount. And Abu Mazen, the leader, the current leader of the Palestinians, denies a connection between the Jewish people and, and Jerusalem. He even says the Jews are trying to Judaicize Jerusalem. You ever heard that? Judaicize Jerusalem. That's like the Chinese are trying to sinify Beijing. And the <laughs> Russians are trying to Russify Moscow. It's absurd, but why are they saying these things which are so factually not true? It's not fake news, it's fake history. Why? Because they're worried that to recognize a connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, to recognize a connection between the Jewish people and Jerusalem is actually to say that the Jewish people are in this land by right and not just by might. And they want to keep their people to believe in this great lie that the Jewish people are foreign colonialists in the land of Israel. It sounds crazy, but they say, you know, for you this land is like... Uh, India for the British, or Algeria for the French, or, or the Congo for the Belgians. But this is the land of Israel. This is where the patriarchs of the Jewish people prayed, where our prophets preached, where our kings rule. We are connected to this land. So President Trump making the decision to no longer leave the legitimacy of Israel's rights in Jerusalem suspended in air punctures this lie. And in laying the cornerstone for that embassy, he actually laid a cornerstone not just for truth, but for peace. Yes. Now, when, when President Trump announced he was going to make the decision, which, if, unless I'm wrong, was early December of last year. December 6th. December 6th. A day that will live famously. <laughs> For the Jewish uh, people for there, a long there time. There were all these warnings that the West Bank and Gaza and much of the Arab world would explode in violence. Um, did not happen, frankly. But then on the day of the dedication ceremony, there was a violent protest on the Gaza-Israeli border. Uh, it, from my vantage point, it looked like it was deliberately designed to sort of create a split screen of contrasts of the ceremony. Uh, those protests and the, the deaths of some of the protesters were heavily covered by the mainstream media. What do supporters of Israel need to know about what happened that day or what may happen in the future with regard to some of this violence? Well, first of all, they, they should know uh, that these were not uh, protesters, peaceful protesters. This was a violent mob. I don't know many peaceful protests, and I've seen those before, you know. Martin Luther King used to have peaceful protests, and Gandhi used to have peaceful protests. They didn't have people in their protests with grenades, with guns, with machetes, with explosive devices, rioting. This was a riot. Uh, and what people have to know, first of all, that has nothing to do with Jerusalem. Don't take my and the moving of the embassy. It happened at the same time, one week. We had protests many, many weeks before, and we had protests after. It had nothing to do with the embassy, and don't take my word for it, take Hamas's word, the terror organization that controls Gaza. They said it had nothing to do with the embassy. But because it happened on a day when administ senior administration officials were there in Jerusalem, the media tried to actually turn it into a story based on no facts at all 
that these protesters in Gaza were protesting the embassy. There were protests against the embassy uh, opening. It was in Judea, Samaria, the West Bank. No one got killed. It didn't make uh, headlines. There was barely nothing in Jerusalem. There was nothing throughout the Middle East. The protests in Gaza, Hamas said exactly what they were for. It was called the March of Return. It was because they wanted the grandchildren, descendants of refugees from our war of independence where Israel was attacked by five different countries. The refugees from that war, they were gonna to return to the homes of the Jews. And the leader of Hamas says, we are going to break through this fence and we're gonna to go to communities right next to the fence and we are gonna pull the hearts out of the Jews. That's the language the leader of Hamas used. So our military is manning that line against that violent mob. And all I'd ask friends of Israel to think about is what would you do if on one of your borders you had 30,000 people, you had a leader who said when they break through that fence, they're going to go into communities a few hundred yards away and we're going to pull the hearts out of the Americans who live there. Would you want your soldiers to man that line and not let them get through that fence? Yes. And we did everything we could. <laughs> Remind you, we don't want to see any violence. And we do everything we can to prevent casualties on their side. I wish we had somebody on their side who cared as much about their people as we care about them. We drop leaflets. We fire tear gas. But we are not going to allow them to break through that fence and slaughter our civilians to get a good story on CNN. Better bad press than a good eulogy. Yes. And I, I just want to add one thing. The spokesman of Hamas, after everybody slammed Israel and all the, you know, the media attacked us for killing innocents, the spokesman of Hamas said six, uh, 50 of the 62 people who were killed that day 50 of the 62 were members of his terror organization. Think about that and how the lies against Israel go all the way around the world a few times before the truth can begin to get its boots on. Israel defends itself, not just as any democratic country would, with, it defends itself in ways that no democratic country would, with greater concern for the civilians of our enemies than any other nation in history. That is the truth, and I'm proud of Israel's military. You know, shortly before the move of the embassy, the president announced that the United States was going to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, you and I had talked about that before. You were hopeful that that was the decision the president would make. Um, I guess my question would be, first of all, as you know, we opposed the original agreement. We did everything we could as an organization uh, to prevent that from taking effect for reasons that we know, don't need to get into today because it's water under the bridge, rather than having a vote on what we thought it legally was, which was a treaty. We had a bizarre parliamentary process in the Senate where the Senate literally had to reject it for it not to take effect. That proved to be a bridge too far. Uh, but now that the United States has withdrawn, number one, let me ask you, two-part question. Number one, do you think the European governments and the private companies that have rushed into Iran to do business will pull out and will go the way of the US? And number two, what do you think comes next with regard to either a replacement for that deal or a coalition effort to contain Iran? Well, first of all, let me thank you for opposing that deal with Iran. It's a badge of honor to anyone who did it at the time. And I don't want to get into all the details, but this deal did not block Iran's path to a bomb. If it did, I, as Israel's ambassador, who face in Iran, our country faces in Iran that openly calls and actively works for our annihilation. If, the, if there would be a deal on the table that would actually prevent Iran from getting the weapons to achieve that goal, I would have gone house to house, community to community, to plead with you to support that deal. The reason why we opposed it, 
And the reason why my prime minister came to Congress to speak against the deal is because the deal didn't do that. It actually paves Iran's path to a bomb. It, it, not just to a bomb, to an entire nuclear arsenal. And all it did was temporarily block them for a few short years. It puts restraints on that are automatically removed a few years later. And then Iran won't need to sneak in or break into the nuclear club. They can just walk it. And I know that uh, a decade seems like a long time in the life of politics, but it's a blink of an eye in the life of a nation. And we saw this deal as cruise control heading over a cliff. And my prime minister was always focused on the cliff. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate President Trump's decision to not kick the can down the road. He could have said, you know what, we're going to be on cruise control for another four years, maybe another eight years. Why should I deal with it? Let it blow up on somebody else's watch. No, he took the wheel and he turned it. He turned it into a different uh, direction. And now Iran does not have a glide path to nuclear weapons. In the meantime, <laughs> from my point of view, from my point of view, Ralph, this is a hinge of history. It's what Churchill spoke of, a hinge of history by turning that wheel. And we are so appreciative of the President of the United States. Talk about standing against the current, mm -hmm. of standing against the current and doing the right thing. And what Iran got from this deal was not just a clear path to the bomb. It got all the sanctions removed that were a headwind that was confronting it. And now you have tens, hundreds of billions of dollars pouring into Iranian coffers. And I'd love to tell you that Iran's Revolutionary Guard has been using that money to establish a GI Bill for returning members of the Revolutionary Guard. But instead, they've been using this to fuel their war machine in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, to fuel their terror campaign. And they have been at war with America for 40 years. This is a government that leads thousands, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions in chance of death to America. Mm -hmm. And empowering this type of enemy in the hope that somehow this will moderate them, in the hope that this will improve it. And you had a situation where Israel was opposed to it. And thank God my prime minister showed up to speak in Congress and tell the truth also to the American people. Yes. But the Arab states also opposed in the region. They weren't willing to say publicly what they believe privately. Now they are. And now you have a situation where your allies in the region are saying this is a bad deal. Let me ask you something, Ralph. Let's say there'll be an agreement with North Korea. And let's say that the British, the French, and the Germans say, you know, that's a great deal. But the Japanese and the South Koreans think it's a catastrophe. Who are you going to listen to? Probably your allies in the region. Well, Israel and the Arab world were the guinea pigs in this failed experiment. Yeah. And we say it's a terrible deal, and we are so thankful, both of us. And when Israelis and Arabs are on the same page, it's usually, usually <laughs> you should pay attention. That's the ultimate no-spin zone. So now you ask me the question about Europe. That the British, the French, the Germans think this makes them safer, well, that's great. People who live in Israel don't. People who live in the region don't. And we think it's a disaster. But I think really they face a choice now, the British, French, Germans, and others. A simple choice. Do you want to choose to do business with a $20 trillion American economy or a $400 billion Iranian economy? Do you want to choose to do business uh, with a country that accounts for over 50% of global capital flows, or do you want to do business with a country that's irrelevant in international financial markets? What do you think a German bank is going to choose? What do you think a French oil company is going to choose? I think it's pretty clear. It required the president's leadership, but I think they're going to follow. And what we want to see happen, they don't want to follow, but this is a pretty strong economy, and hopefully it'll continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, what we'd like to see now is not only them join the United States, but a more and more united effort to roll back Iran's aggression in the region and put enormous pressures on this regime. Because this regime also, people should understand, is hated by its own people. You see some of these protests come out in Iran. You saw it a few months ago. They hate them. But they're governed by these theocratic thugs and killers who run Iran. We should put massive pressure on them, support the, the people in Iran who actually want their freedom and could be allies of Israel and America and everyone else, ratchet up pressures as soon as possible. And uh, I mean, I guess 
what, what Americans are wondering, what people all over the world who are friends of Israel and want to see peace and stability in the Middle East is, will the ending of, and unraveling of this deal prevent Iran from seeking a weapon? Will there need to be further economic pressure? Is there possibility that the United States, Israel, or others will have to consider a, mi a military option? I mean, this looks like a very extreme government. It is, but understand, the, the people who argued for this deal were saying, this is going to bring peace closer. It's going to push war further away. Really? This deal and the funding of all of these enemies, of Israel and America, has only brought war closer. People have been paying attention to what's happening in Syria over the last few months. We've had Iran attack us from Syria. They fired a drone into our airspace. They fired rockets. First time in 40 years, Iran directly followed, fires rockets from Syria into Israel. And we, of course, responded to that fire. So this deal was bringing conventional war with Iran much closer. It wasn't a question that this could happen decades from now or even years from now. It could happen months from now. And it also gave them the clear path to a nuclear arsenal. So right now, the decision the president made makes everybody safer who wants to oppose Iran in the region. Now, Iran will have to make a choice of what they're going to do now. Mm -hmm. I believe that the right policy is a policy of crippling sanctions combined with a credible military threat. We, of course, will never allow a regime that calls for our, our annihilation to achieve and obtain, develop the weapons to achieve that goal. So Israel is committed to preventing it. I think everybody is clear about that. And I think the United States has made it clear that they're never going to allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. Not now, not in five years, not 10 years. And I think that the Iranian people actually take President Trump very, very seriously. That's the mistake that people make. You think... I heard after about the America's credibility, that America's credibility went down when President Trump walked away from the deal, that's absurd. Your credibility with your enemies, and that's where credibility is most important, flew up. Because now your enemies understand that President Trump is not prepared to accept a bad deal that will endanger America in the future. That's a good thing. That's pretty good before you sit down with a regime like North Korea. Believe me, that North Korean leader is more concerned after Trump walked away than if he just would have stayed in the agreement and everybody would have applauded themselves on the back as they stuck their head in the sand. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned Syria. Um, you know, that has been a, 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 a tragic thing to watch unfold. Um, you see different estimates of 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 innocent civilians have been killed. Iran's moved in. Russia's moved in. Uh, Turkey's moved in in a dispute with the Kurds, although it looks like we may have been able to tamp that down a little bit. Um, what, what's the solution to that conflict, or is there one? And given the fact that it's happening right on Israel's border, there's recently been some military activity along the Golan Heights. Um, what needs to be done in Israel's view uh, to bring stability to that troubled country? Well, if you, uh, Ralph, if you ask 100 different Israelis what they'd like to see happen in Syria, you'll probably get 150 different answers. But if you ask them all what they don't want to see in Syria, you're going to get one answer. We don't want to see Iran in Syria. Iran has to leave Syria. That's the great danger for us, because what Iran is trying to do is essentially put a noose around Israel's neck. They already have, through Hezbollah in Lebanon, they have a forward terrorist proxy armed to the teeth, over 100,000 rockets. They're trying to get more and more sophisticated weapons, so they have a forward base of operations against Israel from there. What they're trying to do is establish a permanent military presence in Syria. Iran is trying to establish a permanent military presence in Syria and another forward base to use to attack Israel and to essentially create a land bridge that would stretch from Iran through Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, from Tehran to Tartus on the Mediterranean. I think, I don't know if this is true historically, but I think maybe the last time the Persians were in the, in the Mediterranean was probably in the time of Alexander the Great. So I don't know if you want to actually have that happen with a regime that 
hates America and that's been at war with America for the last 40 years. From the beginning, you almost, they sort of told you what they were all about at hello when they took over your embassy and then bombing U.S. installations uh, in Africa, bombing the Marine barracks in Lebanon, killing 241 uh, U.S. Marines, uh, killing and being responsible for the murder of hundreds of American servicemen in Iraq with the explosives devices that they were passing on to their Shia militia proxies there. This is a regime at war with America that's responsible for the death of hundreds, probably thousands of Americans. So you don't want to let them establish a land bridge into the Mediterranean. So what we need to do is we need to push them back. Now Israel will do its part. We intend to enforce our red lines. We say we're not going to allow them to establish that, uh, that military, those military bases against Israel and Syria. We're going to prevent them from passing on more sophisticated weapons to Hezbollah. We're going to enforce our border. We're going to do all those things and we're going to push them back. But what I think is needed now is frankly a, a U.S.-Russian agreement regarding Syria, a political understanding regarding Syria that will push Iran out. Russia is there. They have interests, long-term interests in Syria for many decades. Russia, unlike Iran, doesn't call for the annihilation of, of Israel. Their interests are not our major uh, concern. And we do believe that there is space and a possibility for a potential U.S. Russian understanding regarding Syria that will push Iran out and will enable that country to have a future. Fantastic. Now, Ron, as ambassador, as much as you interact with the senior councils of this administration, you also understand that um, a country having strong relations with another country given the tremendous historical importance of the bonds of friendship between Israel and the United States, you've also done a lot to build those bonds uh, and deepen that friendship in other areas, in athletics, in culture, in, in music, in, in, in other ways. Talk a little bit about, about that, why you've done that, and maybe share with folks some of the successes you've had. Well, look, this, this relationship between the United States and Israel is very deep, uh, it's very strong, it's very broad. It didn't always start out that way. We tend to glamorize the relationship between the United States uh, and Israel. Uh, in 1948, everybody knows the story that Truman recognized Israel in all of uh, 11 minutes. That's how long it took him. But what they usually don't tell you at those events is that the United States had an arms embargo on a newly established state of Israel in those years, and we were literally fighting for our life in our war of independence, and our enemies were actually getting armed by others. And for the first 20 years, the relationship was one of moral support of certain political leaders. It was actually when Israel proved itself a formidable and powerful ally during the Cold War, both in 1967 by defeating Soviet client states, also in 1973, again, when we had a surprise attack against Israel and we repelled that aggression against us, Israel proved itself in the Cold War a reliable ally, and, and, and then people started investing in it. And then our strategic relationship began, and then we had a peace agreement with Egypt where we had to withdraw from the Sinai, which is a huge piece of territory. It's about two to three times bigger than the entire state of Israel. And so we made a huge concession and the United States rightly wanted to strengthen Israel in the wake of that concession and that move towards peace. But our alliance now uh, with the U.S. is in a different place than it was even in those years because I believe, and this may, may be surprise, maybe won't surprise you, but it may surprise some people, I believe Israel is going to be the most important ally of the United States in the 21st century. The most important. Now, I'll tell you why. You say, well, every ambassador is going to tell us that you are going to be the most important ally. Well, your most important ally in the 20th century was Great Britain. I think we can agree on that. But Israel is going to be the most important for two reasons, security and technology. The great dangers facing the United States in the years ahead are going to unfortunately emanate from our region of the world in the Middle East. Now, if you wanted to send troops there, masses of troops, maybe Israel wouldn't be that important. But I don't think you want to send masses of troops to the region. So I think you need a reliable, democratic ally that shares your interests, shares your values, are willing to defend those interests and those values in the region because you don't want to be there. And we're there. 
You don't have to do nation building with us. We're already built, right? And we're strong, and we share your interests and your values, and we're willing to defend that in the way. We have never in all the years of Israel asked the United States to send troops to defend us. One of the great things about the birth of Israel is for the first time in 2,000 years, the Jews don't ask others to defend them. In Israel, the Jewish people defend themselves. And that, look, Ralph, that's a story of security. And if you think about, well, which country in the world is most important for that security alliance, think about Israel's intelligence agency. One of the best intelligence agencies in the world is, as you saw from that atomic archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how about a round of applause for Israel's Mossad? <laughs> Our intelligence agencies have foiled some two dozen major terrorist attacks, major terrorist attacks in the last few years. A plane being blown out of the sky that was taken off from Australia that was heading towards the Middle East. Uh, terror attacks in Europe on, of, of the scale that you saw in Paris when over 100 people were killed. Those type of attacks, it's Israel's intelligence services that are keeping the world safe and passing that on to other intelligence agencies. So if you look at a security partner around the world, Israel is pretty good, and I put us up there with any of your partners, even your European partners, when it comes to security. But the second thing here, and this is where it sets Israel apart, is technology. Mm -hmm. There are two great centers of innovation in the world. One of them is to the West in Silicon Valley. The other is in Israel. Israel, all of 70 years young and less than, fewer than nine million people, all the size of New Jersey, is a global technological power. We are a global power in agriculture innovation, in water innovation, in cyber. Mm -hmm. Israel, the last couple of years, accounted for 20% of private global investment in cyber. Now, we're one-tenth of 1% 1 of the world's population, and we're getting 20% of the investment. That means we're punching 200 times above our weight. So in cyber, Israel's not a small country the size of New Jersey. Israel's bigger than a China. And you see that in autonomous vehicles. Intel, one of your big companies, bought an Israeli company for $15 billion last year. That's a lot of shekels. <laughs> but also gave them, that company, Mobileye, the keys to their development of autonomous vehicles around the world. So in all of these cutting-edge sectors of tomorrow, who is your best technology partner in the world? It's not a European country. In absolute terms, it's actually Israel. So for those two reasons, security and technology, we're going to move ahead. But I want to get, this is a, a short answer to what was a very long question. <laughs> I want to get back to what you said. Look, we share interests and we share values. But you share interests and values with other democracies. You do. But you don't share with them what you share with us, or they don't recognize it in the same way. You don't share a sense of destiny. Israel and America are not just countries. We are causes. Yeah. And what I will tell you, that as long as Israel and America believe in that cause, this alliance will be rock solid. Because as long as we share that sense of destiny, we will have a sense of destiny. And ultimately, where that has to be shared is not just at the leadership of a president or Congress, it's with the American people. And I've tried as ambassador to reach out to all the groups that you're saying to engage directly with the American people and keep a new generation of Americans connected with Israel. Now today, I'm glad to tell you, uh, Ralph, that Support for Israel is at record highs among the American people. Record highs. And Gallup, Gallup measures it. Mm -hmm. So right now, it's, they ask, you know, are you uh, uh, very favorable, favorable towards Israel? We are at about 75%. 75. Yeah, 75%. The only time ever recorded in the last 40 years that was greater, and it's an annual poll, was in 1991 during the first Gulf War where that number sort of peaked and then it sort of dropped down and it's been rising more or less along a path and it's now about 75% of the American people. Intensity of support for Israel 
those who see Israel very favorably, was 31%, the highest number ever recorded. People in them. And by the way, the sizable chunk of that 31% are devout Christians in the United States. Yep. They are the back, I always say America is the backbone of our support in the world. The backbone of that backbone is the faith community among Christians in the United States. And I, I just tell you how thankful, how thankful we are for that sort of support. But you want to not only engage with them, and, and, and this, this, you know, this, this community, um, people who are members of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, they're really on the front lines, on the grassroots level yep. around the country. And you know who's out there fighting efforts to boycott Israel? to divest from Israel and to sanction Israel, which is pretty much the most foolish thing you can do. You know, to boycott Israel, it's like uh, Oregon, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California boycotting Silicon Valley. Not very smart. But there are people who want to push this agenda to sort of boycott Israel and try to turn us, a most beleaguered democracy on earth, into a pariah nation. You know who's leading that charge against that in many communities? It's actually devout Christians who are fighting at the local level and a state level to make sure that their cities and states never agree to boycotts of Israel, which are anti-Semitism. That's what it is. Yep. And I'll explain why. I'll explain why. When somebody asks me, comes to me and says, well, this or that church group, even church groups, uh, this or that academic group wants to boycott Israel, I ask them, what number are we on your list? Right? And maybe we're number 21, we're number 51, we're number 71 of countries around the world that they've decided to boycott. Because if that's the case, I know, Ralph, I'm dealing with somebody that's got a principle, an organization that has a value, and they put Israel into this wide net. And I see my job as Israel's ambassador to come explain to them why they're wrong, with all the context and all the details and all the, the nuances and complexities. The fact that this is happening, you know, by church groups or academic groups, it just, it, it almost boggles the mind that you have actually church groups in America that would call for the boycott of Israel at a time when Christians are really being, Christian populations are being decimated in the Middle East, Christians literally being decapitated in the Middle East. We're the only country in the Middle East that has a growing and thriving Christian population. It's the state of Israel, four or five times what it was in 1948 when we were established. The only place where Christians are truly safe in the Middle East is in Israel. And so you have church groups asking to boycott, or an academic group. In a world when academics are shot for what they believe, when they're thrown in prison, for their views in dozens of countries around the world, so they'll target Israel. But when somebody comes to me and they say, well, we want to do it, I say, well, what number are we on your list? 21, 51, 71, like I said. So I think if they have a list, I'm going to engage them. But when I find out we're the only ones on their list, there's, there's no one else that they're boycotting. With all of the regimes around the world, 500,000 people dead in Syria, I'm not going to talk about North Korea, because the president has his summit coming up, but everyone knows what goes on in North Korea, or in Iran, or in Venezuela, in all these places where the situation for the public is so bad, and you've chosen to single out Israel alone among countries of the world, the Middle East's only democracy, the only state that values human rights, women's rights, minority rights, you name it, they're in Israel, and you've singled out Israel, there is a name for the singling out of Jews, historically. It was called anti-Semitism. To treat the Jewish people differently than you treat other people, to treat the Jewish state differently than you treat other states, is anti-Semitism, and that has, it has to be fought, and I appreciate the efforts of people who support this coalition to do it throughout the country, and I would encourage you to do even more. Yes. All right. Ron, um, I also get to throw out a couple of pitches. Yes. I, I threw out a first Go, pitch at, uh, at Wrigley two days ago. Uh, I threw out a first pitch at Nat Stadium uh, two weeks ago. I played basketball, uh, football, and baseball, but I'm, I'm disappointed to tell you that the count is 2-0 and oh on those two pitches. Two balls, no strikes. 
So any other sports teams watching, but I still have a few more pitches in me to sort of get it right. If, if you go to the ambassador's Twitter feed, he has posted the video of those two pitches, and we're, we're hoping for a strike next time. Well, I figure go, <laughs> go, go 3-0 and and then really bring the heat. That's, you know, that's, that's my view. We in Israel like to have the odds really, really stacked against us before we actually go in. We're going we're gonna to have you at a Braves game soon, Ron, I'll tell you that. Last, last question. As a, as a Miami boy, I want to know uh, your prediction on the Dolphins' win-loss record this year and whether they is make the playoffs. Is this taped? Huh? Yeah, this is, this is being live broadcast. It's not only taped. This is on C-SPAN. So you're, you're going to go on the record here. Well, see, this was the difference between Ralph uh, and me. He, he wants to get to the promised land, football promised land, through the Dolphins. I learned in about the mid-90s after about 20 years of not being in the promised land that this wasn't going to happen soon, so I just went to the real promised land. Uh, <laughs> but my prediction, like every um, Miami Dolphins fan at the beginning of the season, is that the Miami Dolphins will win the Super Bowl. That's my prediction. <laughs> and, and the Cubs... We're predicting that every year for about 108 years until it happened. And then they did it. But you know what? Here's what I figured. Just say it's going to happen because there's no one in America that is predicting that the Dolphins will win the Super Bowl. But now you have it in, uh, on tape right here at the Freedom and Faith Coalition. We'll see what happens. But one thing I can guarantee you, if the Dolphins are in the Super Bowl next year, I know who I'm going to be sitting right next to. Ralph Reed. Thank you, Ralph, for everything. Ron, you thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.